some, we got something done on the homework, so we're all right for one week. Who knows who did what problems? You pretty much can do any problems you want. I did a little bit of both. A little bit of both. That's well, I think what I would have done. I would have huh? also for you. You know, I, I I can't remember if I told you. I think as I sat and went through the problem sets, I remember last year thinking I don't remember assigning that problem. I think the actual problem set I had there was not from the edition before this, but from the edition even before that, and I just never caught it. So it drives me nuts. You know, if you sat and looked through those, the pictures are the same, the layout's the same, the text is the same, they change a few sections around a little bit, but then most of the rest of it was just jumbling uh, problems. And some of them, it was the very same problem, they'd turn it 90 degrees and put in new values. Yeah. And that was, it's such a racket. And I'm, I apologize. To students for this, it is. It's it's um, it's a racket. And then you know they uh, they have no trouble whatsoever sending uh, instructors as many copies as we want. And then um, you know they they collect and some some professors donate theirs. Some some uh, just keep them all. Some. Uh, I just sell mine on half.com because I'm pretty well underpaid anyway, so I don't squirm about that too much. Anyway, all right, let's go a little bit. We, uh, <clears throat> we've been looking at this simple idea of objects under uh, some kind of load. So we'll take the, the very simplest of the objects and the very simplest of the loads a, a strict axial load. I happen to draw tension, could have been compression, doesn't matter. All of the argument that comes from here is going to be very, very much the same. What we've done so far is look at what happens at an intermediate imaginary cut. And of course, that load must go through any part of that material as a whole if any part of that material at any time is supposed to be under um, static equilibrium. And from that, knowing that this has some cross-sectional area, whether it's circular or square, doesn't matter, we from that got an idea of this normal normal stress that the uh, material is undergoing. What I'll do for now is I'm going to call this A sub zero because that's going to be a reference area. Uh, I could put an N, I guess, because it is the normal area no, being normal to the axial length of the piece, if you will. But what we're going to do now is do this very same thing only instead of making a normal cut, we're going to make a, an oblique cut. It's still true that the load P must be transmitted through that cross-sectional area. This oblique cut is at an angle of theta from the normal. That then for us exposes a, a couple different things going on. Two, thing, two things we need to look at. Um, one is that now this area that's supporting this load, A theta, is a little bit bigger than was A zero. Because we've tilted back our, our ob oblique plane a little bit, because of that we've now exposed some extra area and uh, without, without uh, too much of a belaborment, I guess, we can, uh, we can uh, relate those two. That this will be A0 over cosine theta. Is that right? I think that's okay. Yeah, because cosine theta is less than 1, so a theta is always greater than a0. Um, and if, uh, 
if theta happened to be zero, the cosine is one. So we're okay. I think I got that right. Got that? Yep. Yeah, you're okay with that? All right. So that, that's one thing we can do with that. The other thing we can do with that, and I just want to take this drawing and bring it up there so it's a little bit bigger. And I've got a little bit more room for it. We've got this load P that's axial to the P. So remember, it could be compression too, and none of this argument would change. I just had to draw one or the other. We can break that into two components. One component perpendicular to that face, and one component parallel to that face. So we'll take the load. Now reference that load to our to our uh, our oblique direction. What that does for us is show us that there's this normal force, maybe I'll call it F. And this this normal, let's see, that's uh that's what? That's, uh, that's P, uh, let's see, that's P over cosine theta as well, isn't it? No, that's P times cosine theta. Sorry. That's why it's always good to take notes in chalk, because it's so easy to correct. That's P cosine theta. And that is normal to the force, uh, sorry, to the face, which leads us to a normal stress on this oblique plane of, well, whatever load is normal to that face, which is our new F, over the area that's holding it, which was our A theta. And if we put in what we know about A theta and what we know about F, we get then that uh, this is P cosine theta over A zero. All I'm doing is, is getting back to our, our, our original load, our original cross-sectional area. And there's an extra cosine theta under there, so this becomes P cosine squared theta over A zero. And notice that that P over A zero was our original uh, normal stress. Maybe I better change this. Let's make this not A n, let's make this A theta at our reference plane. That way we don't have two sigma n's on the page. So this then becomes sigma n, our original normal stress, times cosine squared theta. Fair enough? When is that? a maximum. At what angle of theta is that stress a maximum? Yeah, when theta equals zero, or in other words, our original situation. It's, it's at the, the greatest normal stress is when we're looking at a plane straight across the piece. Uh, that's our, that's our biggest concern at max when theta equals zero degrees. Uh, no big deal, I guess, uh, because as we go off angle, we reduce the normal force, but increase the area, so of course the stress is going to drop. 
So if we have a failure due to normal, exceeding normal stress, we would expect that failure to occur essentially perpendicular to the, across the piece. Uh, we can take that into design considerations if we need to. As we start looking at more technical materials where we can design them for certain strengths and certain directions, we can handle that. Now we look uh, at the shear across the face. We have a pure axial load, but now we see that in certain directions there are actually shear concerns that arise from a purely axial load. So we have to take those into consideration. Let's see. This is, uh, this is P sine theta. And the shear stress across that face, remember, is the load over the area supporting it, which in this case is our A theta. So if we put in the shear we know with respect to the original load and whatever uh, angle we're looking at, and we put in this A theta, that gives us P sine theta cosine theta. Oh, sorry, sorry, over A zero. So this actually has, uh, has a magnitude of our original normal stress, even though it's a shear stress, this is just that gives us a magnitude, sine theta, cosine theta. orthogonal uh, cross-sectional area. Actually, if, if, you, uh, if, you, if, if this is a very regular solid, then this is actually the minimum possible cross-sectional area. Any other angle is just going to increase the area. And remember, these are not real cuts we make through here. These are imaginary cuts. So, so we can look at what's going on internal to the material. At what angle is this a maximum? That's, that's a little bit harder to see. Um, at, at theta equals zero, the sine is zero. So that certainly we wouldn't expect to be a maximum. At theta equals 90, well, that's when we're laid all the way over and we our cross-sectional area goes all the way along the edge of the piece. That doesn't even make any sense. But again, this disappears because then cosine is zero. But at, do we, what'd you say? 45. At 45 degrees, this is a maximum. What that means is under pure axial load, we are worried about shear failure at an angle of 45 degrees. And I believe in your book, there is a picture of a piece of material that was under a pure axial load and then failed, actually ruptured. And uh, if it's not in the book, or if they removed it from the new book, I'll get a copy and put it up on Angel for us. But the failure looks like this. You'll see, you'll see kind of a conical piece at roughly 45 degrees as this, this part pops apart. Because of the shear failure 
at the 45 degrees. It's roughly, roughly in here. 45 degrees. And you see this kind of conical piece that, that just popped out of itself. It was the shear that actually made it fail at this 45 degrees that was greater than the normal stress. And so we had that, that kind of conical 45 degree shape failure to it there. All right, we're going to have to keep that in mind a little bit as we go on to some other things. So, okay, before I clean the board? Do we have the right side? Over there? I'll start erasing over here. Take my time. Uh-oh, 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 I'll stop. I'll, I'll clean up some more over here. for a little bit more. It'll drive me nuts, but I'll, I'll leave it here. We, we, better, we better put up a barrier here to keep us from wandering. All right. So here's where we're going to take that next. Let's, uh, let's look at a more general situation. So here's, uh, here's some engineering thing we've got, some component, uh, some, some piece of a bridge, piece of a machine of some weapon you carry around. I don't know what you guys do. And we'll uh, reference, it, reference it in x, y, and z directions. And this could be under some kind of load. Who knows what? There's one force there, and another force over here, and another force out the back going that way. Who knows what kind of loads could be on this thing? could be loads all over the place. Of course, what we're worried about is not each individual force necessarily, but what we're interested in, of course, is the net load on any of those, or, or due to all of those, because of course that must sum to zero in the end. We need to have static equilibrium on this at all times. So we'll sum all the forces together. It could be one single force. You know, who knows where it's going to come out, uh, what it's going to do. Maybe it looks something like that. And then, of course, we know that we must have it in static equilibrium. So we have that, that out the other side. Uh, we're looking for a general case. So, so Individually, what's going on is not our big concern. So what we're going to do is what we've done before, is we're going to take our engineering object, whatever it is, but we're going to imagine exposure of one face. Make a, an imaginary internal planar cut through the material to see what the loads are on that face. Now, to make it easy, and since it's arbitrary anyway, we want this face to be um, perpendicular to the x direction. Just, just for reference purposes, and that's no big deal, because we can point the coordinate system anywhere we want. So we want that face to be perpendicular, normal, to the x direction. So that face is parallel to the yz plane. Does it look like that in your drawing? I bet it does. Jake's does, because he takes technical free and sketching. This is no big deal for you. You're laughing at this stuff. All right. And because of this, whatever this net force is, um, and just like we had here, this could give rise to both a normal stress, that being perpendicular 
to that face. And that's easy to do. That's very easy to, to set up uh, because our cut through the material was perpendicular to the x-direction. So automatically we have this normal stress that, uh, that will exhibit itself. A little bit more problematic is whatever the other component of this resultant is, this shear component, because it could lie in any direction. Maybe it lies in that direction just because of what all the other forces were and what this resultant is determines then over that area, that exposed area, than what these uh, stresses are. Now, uh, well that's not a big deal because no matter what direction this shear is, we can break it into components. Sorry, what I should have is not, not the shear itself. I should match it. Uh, that's the stress, shear stress that I'm, I'm exhibiting there because it's over, it's that shear V over that area. Um, it doesn't really matter what direction that is because we'll break it into component directions that are parallel to the y and z directions. So we'll take it out, maybe I'll draw it like this. Uh, well, let's leave it like that. You're done, Bob. Sorry, I gotta erase this side now. We, there's progress here. You cannot stand in the way of progress. All right, so we'll We'll take our engineering material with its exposed face that's perpendicular to the uh, normal direction, uh, the x direction. So we have this normal stress there. And we're going to break this shear stress into components parallel to the y and parallel to the z directions. So that'll be uh, one component there. And I'll call that tau x because it's on an x direction face. Remember this cut, imaginary cut through the material, is perpendicular to the x direction. That means it's what we call an x direction face but it itself points in the y direction. So I'll call that tau xy. That's, that's the vertical component of this shear. And now I'll do the z component. And that will be tau, because it's a shear stress. It's on an x face, but it's in the z direction. So I took this, this, this stressed material, put an imaginary cut through the material perpendicular to the x direction, and then that allowed me to expose these stresses interior to the material based on arbitrarily chosen coordinate directions. Normal stresses, is that parallel to the x-axis? Yeah. Um, and that one's parallel to the y-axis, and that one's parallel to the z-axis. Everybody okay with that? A, a, a challenge uh, imagining that, a, a challenge sketching it. Here's what happens next with it. We made that imaginary cut, that first imaginary cut, perpendicular to the x-axis, parallel to the yz plane. We're now going to do that in the other directions. And there's five more directions we need to do. 
because we need to make a cut on a plane that's perpendicular to the y direction and one that's perpendicular to the z direction. So that's, that's three total. We need to make three more cuts because we also have minus x, minus y, and minus z directions to cut. Uh, when we do that, what we're left with then, of course, is a cube. That's what we're left of our engineering material after we've made cuts across all of the faces, all of the possible directions. Three coordinate directions, but each one has a plus and a minus face on it. And on each face now is exposed these very same kind of things. In the coming out from that face, we have a normal stress that's perpendicular to that face itself, like that. Jake, you, you got about to about be all jazzed about this. This is exactly what we were doing in technical freehand sketching yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah. And we have the two shear stresses that we've exposed. So that goes right up the face in the x, uh, sorry, y direction. That's tau x y. Across the face, that's tau x z. Remember, the first letter tells us what face we're on. The second letter tells us in what direction it lays itself. So that's just uh, a reprint of what we've already done here. But we've also done the other direction. So coming straight out of this face, straight up in the y direction, we have sigma y. Remember, those could also be in compression. I happen to draw attention because I have to draw something. But they could just as easily be the other way and be in compression. And that's also perpendicular to that upper face. And we also have a shear laying across the face. That would be tau. What would its subscripts be? X. It's on a y face in the x direction. So it's tau y x. And we might have a shear in this direction too, which would be tau yz. It's on the y face and it's in the z direction. How's everybody doing with these drawings? Yeah, you don't want to draw too small or you're going to be hurting. Got to make these kind of big, get everything fit in there. Pat, not too bad. Jake, do I need to call Professor Hampshire over to check this? Oh, it got stepped on. Juby, beautiful. Awesome. Nice and big. All right. Then we have this one more exposed face here. So we've got uh, a sigma in the z direction there. Remember, that's a normal. That's normal to that face. And I just arbitrarily chose drawing it in the positive direction, but it could be compression as well. Any one of these could lay in the opposite direction. I have to draw something. Um, then we've also got a shear across that face, which I'll call tau sub what sub what? Tau, it's on a z direction face. It's in the x direction itself. So it's tau zx. And then there's one more possible there. I happen to draw in the positive direction. I don't need to. That's tau z y. And exactly the same type of thing on the three back sides that aren't exposed. But 
for equilibrium, everything on the back side's got to have uh, the opposite direction of any of these. So sigma x coming out this side, it's got to come out the other side on the back because this piece is always going to be in equilibrium. And these values come right from the forces exerted in those directions themselves. All right, so let's uh, let's do this a uh, little bit. We'll need this. Well, let's see. Uh, yeah, we're okay. We're doing all right. Remember, the forces must always sum to zero. The forces are all of the form. Uh, for instance, the force in the x direction is the stress in the x direction times the uh, the area over which it's acting. But it's a cube, so all these areas will be the same. Remember that's that, that for this that particular one, it's that front exposed face. All the forces take that general form. The stress times the area over which they're acting. So we could sum all those up and we'll We'll do so rather quickly in a second. Also, don't forget though, all of the moments must sum to zero too. That's more of a concern. Well, that's not a concern with the forces that are causing these normal stresses because those are all collinear with the whatever forces on the opposite face. So those forces are automatically zero. But all these shears are caused by forces that are uh, equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, and separated by some distance, whatever the size of our cube is here. So we're going to have to balance all those moments. What we'll do is we'll take one look at one face. We'll look at the, we're going to look right down the z-axis now. We're looking right up here, up along the z-axis. So our face is a square like that. We'll give it each side a length A. It's a cube, so it's a cube of A by A by A just so we have that as reference. You can imagine, I hope, that that is not going to be material to the solution in the end. And if we draw the forces on these spaces, let's see, we have the force here is sigma x times the area over which it's acting. which we can either just call the whole area delta A or we can call it little a squared. It doesn't matter. They're all the same for all of them. So we'll just call it delta A. Shouldn't be a, a big stretch of your imagination here that we're going to be done with those very shortly. We have a shear going across this space of magnitude tau. It's on an x space. It's in the y direction and it's operating across the very same area. So now I'm drawing the forces. Stresses I have over here in blue, forces I have over there in pink. So it's a slightly different drawing. Why, that, why do we read the area in delta A? Uh, just because I'm drawing the forces, so it's a shear stress acting over an area. So I'm just calling uh, one face of this cube delta A. I could write a squared. It doesn't matter because as you can probably start to anticipate now that that's going to cancel out in the end, we'll be done with it. Because you know, this, this whole study can't depend upon what the size of the cube is. We'd have to redo it for every single little piece and we wouldn't, we'd never get any general, general idea of what's going on. So if I draw the faces, uh, sorry, the force out of this face, 
That's tau, uh, sorry, sigma y, also acting on the very same area because it's a cube. I have this shear stress, tau, this is yx. operating on the air. That's the shear across that face. And I have the same thing going out the back sides. Sigma x delta a, it's in the opposite direction. Sigma y delta a just the area of this side, one side of the cube, and also the shear going across it. So this is tau x y delta a. This is tau y x delta a. Stressing your, your ability to see things in multiple dimensions here. Alright. The sum of this is remember now a free body diagram. These are the forces. The sum of the forces is identically zero. We don't even need to mess with that. Every force on here has an equal and opposite one, which it always must have had uh, because this piece has always been in equilibrium right from the start. So we, have, we don't even need to worry about that one. But let's look a little more closely at the fact that the moments must sum to zero. Um, the normal stress forces, we don't need to worry about. There's no moment arm there. It's these shear stresses we need to worry about. So we can take this one, tau x y delta a, that's the force. The moment is due to the couple of these two on opposite faces, equal and opposite, going opposite directions, separated by a moment arm of a. That's that's these two shear stresses here that cause a moment. Now we've got another moment in the opposite direction on the opposite face. So it's minus tau y x delta a. That's the force, the shear force. The couple is due to that moment arm between the two. And that must all sum to zero, because the moments must sum to zero. And we can do the same thing on the opposite. We, we could look down the y-axis and look down the x-axis, do the very same drawings. Let's see, since this all equals to zero, then the area, uh, the, the, uh, the dimension of the side, that was the moment arm of the couple, cancels. And the size of the face cancels as well, leaving us with this very useful fact that tau xy equals tau yx. That's very useful because it, it sure, sure simplifies all these drawings. Now, we don't need to do anything more than sigma x in that direction. And remember, those could be compression. I just happen to draw attention. 
sigma y in that direction. And then all of the shear stresses are just, we'll just call them tau. It's got to be tau uh, xy or yx, they're the same thing. It's got to be that because we're looking at an xy drawing. So we're, we're not even going to mess with a subscript on that. Because if we go around in all the other directions, all those shear stresses must be the same. So that's all we need. Uh, to describe the whole piece, the only thing that would be missing is whatever sigma z is itself. All right, the, uh, the only other thing, uh, well, we don't need to add that to it. We're okay with that. Okay, everybody, everybody, uh, You feeling stressed yourself? See, see, you thought you thought stress was stuff like, oh, oh my gosh, where's my cell phone? Is it charged? You thought that was stress. This is stress, man. You got to understand the forces and the stress they cause, and you have to go the stress of trying to draw three-dimensional pictures under pressure because we're moving kind of fast through all these pictures. That's real stress, not this. Uh, uh, do I have a date for Saturday night? Do you? Uh, no. Not yet. Prospects? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Well, we're 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 hoping for you. Don't forget, there's a, there's a, what chemistry.com and some of those other things <laughs> that, that they can they can help. All right. Any questions on this? We're going to come back to this in just minutes. Uh, well, actually, we may have to wait until. Uh, Friday to come back to these these shear stresses on these spaces and, and the kind of thing that they can cause. So everybody all right? I can erase the whole board if I want to. We gotta let Professor Ham Professor Hampshire see this drawing, huh, Jake? Yeah. This 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 uh, this video. So all right. So that's that's our first look at all of these stresses plus a little peek at some of what can happen if the stresses are too great. But there's uh, there are other concerns as we apply these loads. And that has to do with how the pieces themselves actually deform, these deformations. Sure there's failure, that's uh, certainly one deformation, but we may have deformations that are 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 more elastic in nature. So we're going to look at those type of things because these are these are things that have to be very very closely understood by engineering designers because any time a piece undergoes load, it's going to deform. If it deforms elastically, then if that load is removed, it will return to its normal length and everything's fine. If it deforms inelastically, you may have a, a design failure of some kind and the piece may need to be redone, may need to be repaired, may need to be redesigned. But we're going to look at elastic deformations. This is what happens every time a, a truck drives over a bridge. It loads all the members in different ways. But once that truck's gone, the bridge returns to its unloaded state, ready for whatever next truck drives by. So we're going to look at all of those type of deformations. The first one, and the simplest one, um, uh, any time in this class I draw this kind of thing, this means it's an unmovable anchor. Whatever I attach to it, that thing itself will not move. We're only concerned with what's going to happen to the part that is attached to it. So I have a, a simple piece here which I'll happen to draw in tension.
because of that tension, well, we already know that there's going to be a normal stress there. We've looked at that some. Uh, we know that at, at certain angles there's uh, additional shear stresses we'd be concerned with. What I want to concern ourselves with now is the fact that once loaded like this, and I'm exaggerating it, that piece will tend to, in this case, elongate because I happen to draw it in tension. If I drew it in compression, it would tend to shrink. So we have this exaggerated elongation of some distance we'll call del. Greatly exaggerated here, of course. Well, it wouldn't be, I guess, because this piece could be rubber or something. And what we'll do with that is we'll define the normal strain. We've looked at the stress. Now we're going to look at what we call the strain. Normal still means the same thing it did before. The, the load is perpendicular to the area supporting it. Uh, a little bit more of what we mean here is that the elongation, the deformation is perpendicular to the load or to the face. So we'll define the normal strain. Use the symbol uh, that's a lowercase sigma. Actually, no, it's a, a epsilon, sorry. Lowercase epsilon. Defined as the deformation we see under load, and that could be negative, divided by the original length of the piece itself. So we'll call that L for simplicity. Simple as that. Put it under load. See how much it stretches. Compare that to the original length. And that's the normal strain. Uh, we don't have in there the size of the force causing it, nor the area supporting it. All we're looking at is the response of the material to that load. You, uh, you Maybe your experience um, with how things stretch, whether it's a rubber band or a spring, indicates that, that the original length does have something to do with it. If you have a short spring, you can't pull it very far. Where if you have a long spring, you can really pull it far. Simple as that. What are the units on it? What now? I doesn't matter. I'll watch the tape. Let's see what you said there, Bob. Because I now have a directional mic pointed right at you. You always sit in the same spot. <laughs> I'm just going to get an extra camera. Put it right on you. You never know. What are the units? The units might be uh, meters per meter, inches per inch. They might be nothing because they cancel. There are also other options though, that, that we do with this. This deformation, as you can imagine, especially with engineering, engineering materials like steel and uh, uh, aluminum and iron and those type of things, this deformation is not very big. You, could, you couldn't get some piece of metal and hang from it and actually notice any stretch going on there. It's very, very small. For uh, a very large piece like on a bridge, where the pieces are quite long, it could become noticeable, especially if there's a whole bunch of pieces and each one of them has a deformation of its own and those tend to add up over the length of the structure. Uh, so with bridges, this kind of thing has to be very closely uh, monitored. Um, it tends to be more like on the order of 10 to the minus 6 meters per in, uh, meter or 10 to the minus 6 
inches per inch. So we also then might say it's a micrometer per meter or a micro inch per inch or might eliminate that completely and just call it a micro because the units don't matter so cancel out the meters it leaves just the, the uh, SI prefix micro and so we can call it that. Uh, yeah, but, but, but that's not sufficient. We, we want to throw more possibilities in here because the more possibilities, the more opportunity for befuddlement of students, the more excited we are about that. So we might also call this a micro rad. Remember, radians is kind of a magic unit itself, so uh, I think that's where it comes from. Or we can look at this elongation as a percentage of the original length. So whatever number we get there, multiply it by 100% and call it that. So it might also come as a percentage. So you, you choose any one of those you like. Alright, let's, let's start a setup of a type of problem we might see doing this. It's a very, fairly simple idea, just uh, you, you load something and it's going to stretch some, some amount. So, imagine we have here a beam of some kind pinned at one end. but supported at two places. So, supported there by a cable and supported there by a cable. This distance, three meters. That distance, four meters. But I'm gonna split it in the middle with some kind of load that's on this beam. So it's two meters on either side of that. label some parts here. We'll call that point A, B, C, D, E. Just for reference. We find that due to that load, the piece itself displaces by ten millimeters on that end. Oh, sorry, one more thing we need. Uh, the length of each of these two cables we'll call four meters. Ah, so clearly it's not to, not to scale. Because <laughs> that four meters looks pretty darn close to that ten millimeters. So, so for, for your benefit, it's just a cartoon. All right. So the, the support cable DB stretches by a certain amount, as does the support cable EC. Find the strain in each of those. So find the strain in BD and the strain in C. E as well. Just as a as a practice step for us to get used to the units and the sizes and and uh, the simplicity really of this calculation. Not in the mood. You what? Remember. 
remember we have the strain as the deformation by the divided by the original length itself. So both, most of those, in fact, uh, this this one over here really couldn't be a whole lot more straightforward. It just really much pretty much comes right off the page there. Just remember you've got to get the right lengths in there and then watch your units a little bit. So I'll leave it to you to express it in three different sets of units, your, your favorite from that list. anything, these problems tend to be problems in geometry. While it's fairly straightforward seeing what the elongation of the cable CE is, it's a little bit different how much elongation the cable BD itself underwent. It's just a little bit of a problem of geometry. one yet in your favorite set of units. The elongation for this one right off the picture 10 millimeters original length 4 meters. Pat what units did you pick? Because we can we can reduce this to something uh, at least simpler to write. Uh, percent. What, so what percent? Uh, 0.25 percent. All right, fair enough. One way to write it, 0.25 percent. Anybody do it in, in micros? Okay, and it had what? 0.0025. 0.0025. Two five meters over meters, or could just leave that off and just say it's point zero zero two five. Pat took it, multiplied it by a hundred, called it percent. Another possibility, and then we're done. Twenty five thousand. I'm sorry, twenty five hundred micros. All right, your ticket for readmission on Friday is to have that if you don't already. If you already have that, then you can stay until Friday and not even leave. All right.